Okay. Okay, I'll skip. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, for these slides, I just, it's really a summary of a lot of things. And I just add some more pictures and more decorations to make things more clearer <laughs> for myself. <laughs> well, basically, like the, the chapter just covers like two main unsupervised learning techniques. One is the principal components analysis, and the other one was just, they just say it was clustering. They gave a brief introduction of what unsupervised learning is and the challenges that it faces. So how they define it is that they say it's usually performed during exploratory data analysis that given a set of features and n amount of observations, they want to find something interesting. So usually they want to find like subgroups among the variables like like this one here of such good amount of observations, which is more like this case here. But even though we're not covering like by clustering algorithms, but I thought it's a good way to show what interesting groups could be. <laughs> then they say there was no clear criteria to determine if the group is interesting or not because it's a subjective thing. The book then starts with the uh, introduction of the PCA and they said that they assume that the data set is preferably have come some relationships that were correlated, like these uh, variables are correlated. And the PCA is able to summarize them by reducing the P to a smaller value like M, M less than P into a new set of variables. They call it Z. And somehow uh, Z is able to explain or summarize most of those called variabilities in the original data set and we have seen the case before in the uh, regular in chapter six whereby the first principal components was this long green line and the second one was the one perpendicular to it so they assume that all the first they shift all the data to have mean zero or basically they shift the whole thing to have the center to be the mean to be at the zero point. And then they express the principal components in terms of its features and loadings. And it must be in this format and certain conditions. So uh, it's a bit technical. So I just go through the next slide of what how the loadings look like by using a example from Tao's dad. So it's a 20 minute video, but I decided to summarize it in a few slides. So this is like the X data that we had that we sent it to mean zero. And then these uh, loadings that we have, uh, these red arrows over there and the YouTube video gives the values of these loadings and I just label them accordingly. So it's like this 0 0.59 is just moving like for a uh, horizontal 0 0.59 followed by a vertical uh, 0 0.81. And this one is moving the other side by 0 0.81 and moving up by 0 0.59. And then these loadings will then transform all these points into the scores. And then we have the principal components with the new values. So this is the sort of summarize like the scores that we have, or the Zs, the Zs, which we defined earlier. So the Zs are like the scores, which are like the new positions over here, like the new positions of where the points are transferred to and they are calculated based on like matrix multiplication so I, I just wrote some long-winded uh, notes to see what it actually means so this is like how the first point is calculated how the second point was calculated and if we were to do the same thing for here and the loadings that we defined earlier we should get back these values over here and then they say that the each of these loadings, they're not like determined randomly. They're meant to optimize something. And they gave these uh, 
the book gave this very abstract formula. Uh, however, what I have done is try to simplify things get to explain what it means. So what it does is that this big chunk here, well, that is the score, right? That is the points that we have. And since the mean is zero, we can just substitute this whole thing with the zij and add a minus zero there to simplify it. And what we have here is the variance of the scores. So what is the variance of the score is actually the variance of this column over there. And if you were to look at the examples that we provided from Taos, that we can see that these loadings that was determined earlier and the output, the variance, the resulting variance, you can see that it's quite high compared to these two variants on the left. So indeed, it is truly like a way of maximizing and getting all the information of the data in terms of its variance. The next part of the chapter was to have an alternative interpretation of what PCA is besides uh, creating directions and loadings that maximize the variance of the data. So they said that the first principal components or this not by this symbol is actually the line. And this line is special such that the line is arranged such that it is as close to all the points as much as possible, the perpendicular distance range each point. So This is the example that we have uh, initially for chapter six. However, for the book, they also increase the dimensions to two dimensionals as well. And in terms of two dimensions, uh, delta one and delta two, uh, they define it as this 2D plane that we have here. And then I just draw some pictures to see like, like how I look as the result. So our results, we usually see like this, but what really happens is that our eyes are actually looking at this perspective, this plane of the data. And we can see like similarly to the line where the line like best fits the data sets, the plane also tries to best fits the data set as well. So now that we've seen like the first and second dimensions, they begin to generalize to uh, all the higher dimensions. So using a special property that the inverse of the loadings is the same as this transpose. Oh, uh, you can see like this is the loading and then the transpose, which is the inverse, is just shifting the two down, the trough down, the two one up here. And when we have the full dimension where n is equals to the p or the number of data sets that we have, it is possible to get back our x, our original data set. So this is how we get from the scores from the original data set using the loadings. However, from the scores, we can also get back our original data set by taking the inverse of the loadings. Now, the problem comes when we do not have all the loadings, we like, let's say this case we will have two, but let's say if we have only have one, then we have an estimation of the X instead. So this is what happens when the M is less than P or we have all the principal components. Our X, when we do the reverse part, our X becomes an, our scores become an, like, an estimate of the original value. And we can use the diagram as follows in this picture here, whereby the X is like the original point and our, our, this symbol is when we calculate it back using the scores, using an incomplete uh, list of principal components. And it is expected that as our M gets closer to P, this, this gap will get smaller. We then proceed to the proportion of variance explained. So variance represents how much information uh, for given data is lost as a result of the projection. So the, the book defines some parameters. So since that all our data set has mean zero, so we can re-express this variance of x to have in terms of data set minus mean and just takes the square. 
and then we take its mean. On the other hand, the variance of the M principal components, it's the variance of the score, which we did so earlier on, which is which is this one here, it's the same thing. So the proportion of variance is just the ratio of the two of them, but uh, this is just an example of what these symbols mean in terms of uh, actual values used from tau stats. So this part here is the variance of the data set, and this is the variance of the principal components. And if you add them together, they actually give you the same value. So the proportion of variance is just the ratio of these two formulas that we calculated earlier. I, I removed the zero in this case uh, because we don't need it, but it's basically the two ratios. So this is the ratio for if you use only the PC one, whereby only 12.08 is used, and it's the total variance. We add these two, and this is the proportion of variance that we have. Now, uh, the variance of the data can also be decomposed. So uh, we can, so this is the earlier on, that this is the bottom part of the formula here. And this is the top part. So the missing part, they define it as the MSE of the M-dimensional approximation. So to make it simpler from this complicated formula, I decided to use these examples again from Tau's dad to, to show what it means. So this is the variance of data I denote as 12.4. So the variance of the first MPC is actually for our example here, it's 12.08 because we only use PC1. And this MSE is, I just use PC2 as the example here. So what the book did was that they rearranged this formula. So I copy it back to the top part. And then they said that they will bring this to the left-hand side. So now it's on the left-hand side. So I copy back this formula here. And then they divide everything by the variance of the data. So this is the variance of the data. They assume that it's not zero. So this part becomes one. This whole big part, the one minus the one over n can cancel off and just left with these two. And for the right hand side, we have this. And then I just uh, simplify in a way such that it looks like the PVE formula that we defined earlier. So what we have here is the one and then this ratio that we have earlier, and this is just the PVE. Then the book defines that this top part here is the residual sum of squares, and this bottom part here is our total sum of squares, and then I just replace them with their alphabets. And then they say that the cumulative PVE is similar to the linear regressions are uh, R square, which is kind of uh, 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 analogous to the picture here that we have. So it's like the R, this, this distance can be treated like the sum of these distance and the average can be treated as the, like the linear regressions R square. The next part of the section was about more on PCA. So they cover like some things of what PCA can do and what it cannot do. The first part that the book covered is that why is there a need to scale the variables that have standard deviation of one? And they use this example here. So here we can see on the uh, left is when you have everyone with the same uh, unit standard variance and we don't see any uh, strong uh, variables. However, on the unskilled part, we can see that the assault is very, very large in value. And because it's very large in the value compared to the other 
uh, variables. Larger values also give some form of bias that it has a larger variance as well. And so uh, we may misinterpret that assault is actually really important. But this is actually not the case because when we scale everything back to the same standard deviation, we can see that uh, <coughs> sorry, we can see that the other variables are also equally as important as well. This one just clarify scaling is like how we usually do like variables where where we have like variables on different measurement scale, right? So then we usually will center to the mean to the zero and standard deviation to one, is it? That's why uh, yes. that's why yeah. when it's unskilled because so to clarify just to clarify. Because when it was unskilled, the variable assault has very large variances. Okay. Yeah. But then when yes. we scale it, we don't see the associations between the four variables because it looks like their relative positions are quite similar. Uh, right. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's so, really like if the assault like takes too much of the variance, we cannot like it, it must be other variables like importance as well. Mm -hmm. The reasons why like so it seems that because PCA is based on the calculations of the variance where they have the variance of the PCA over the total variance of the data. So yes, it means that yes. if the total variance in the data is like huge, then it will affect the calculation, right? Yeah, it's more like mm -hmm. EC1 will be biased to one variable. Mm -hmm. And we may mistakenly think that the other variables are not so important. Not so important. Mm -hmm. Like an, it's like an underestimate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the second part is just saying that this loading is different by sign flip. So I just give an example, like one example that is just the loadings that we have in chapter six, and this is the sign flip that it has. So we just the sign flip is just changing the direction of the loadings, and nothing more than that. They also say like how many principal components is enough and they say that we can use the squeeze plot but actually it's just calculating like the proportion of variance that we have as we increase our principal components which is the same formula that we showed earlier. So this, this one. And then the second one is the cumulative which is this one here which is kind of like similar similar to, to the one on the left I said that instead of the left one goes down to close to zero and the top one goes up to one and they say they want to find the so-called the point where between when it drastically goes down and everything becomes constant on the right. But you mentioned it here, this, the script plot, it can be very subjective. This one is the part that I always get confused when I know I do like PCA analysis, right? You have this script plot. I always don't know when, because this is usually used to determine how many factors, let's say out of 10 factors, like how many factors are actually just necessary to explain the variances. Like for me, like, I understand that maybe the first factor is important, like the first, second one, because you see the variances are quite extreme. But then it's like after that following factor three and factor four, it seems that the proportion of variance are about the same, right? So I'm not sure like should we only include up to like one, two, three and exclude four or should we do one, two, three, four? Like here is like only I... four. <laughs> Yeah, I guess because you have only four, I think it's up to you how much you can look at it because this one will always go down. Yeah, yeah. Then the other and one will go up. Sometimes <laughs> the 
the higher ones may give you the one that is meaningful. <laughs> like we could. Yeah, but the thing yeah. is like for screen pot, right? You don't know where is the cutting point. Like yeah. which and even part if the you main... know the cutting point, right? You also don't know which plot. Like it's like the gating problem in full psychology, right? Okay, let's say if up to five mm. principal components, you don't know whether is it two and five, four or five, or mm. three or five that gives you the plot that you want that shows the like some separation between two groups. Yeah. So that's like I feel like this is the tricky part, like how you actually yeah. separate those like thin two groups. I think things get pretty scary when you have like yeah, it goes down and then it starts being constant and then it goes down again. Oh, does that happen? I've never seen that before. So it will yeah, go down I constant and go down. That's quite common in the genomic studies. Oh. And show this paper that I have in the slides. Uh, that shows that when you have these cases, you have to be careful. And maybe it also shows that maybe PCA was not the best visualization to use. Mm, okay. When you have variables that are really uncorrelated to each other, or when all the variables are uncorrelated, it actually gives you a straight line. Mm, yeah. Mm, okay. Because when all your variables are uncorrelated, then everyone explains something that the other can right so it's yeah. actually distributed so and it's really one straight line <laughs> yeah but I, I assume when you're doing a PCA analysis the variables have to be correlated to certain points right isn't that part of the assumptions they because I'm not sure I only use PCA analysis like when we want to test the items in the scale we just want to make sure all the items are correlated so I've never seen those like horizontal but lines that after that they drop before again. Well. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting to know. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> well, of course, usually in textbooks, like everything will be nice and <laughs> everything just works. <laughs> Uh, this one is a bit different. I just took it from other sources. Like this case, uh, I just took it from nature's paper, nature's uh, points of significance. And yeah, they have a series of statistic stuff, but I just took it from their principal components uh, paper, which I forgot where it is. Yeah, this one here. And I just take the snapshot of the pictures and they just show like cases where maybe the PCA will not work. <laughs> so uh, what they do is that the first line is the like the first PCA and the second one is the second PCA and the data is only two-dimensional. So if you only look at the first PCA and just squeeze everything to it, right? Like the first one, the A, if you squeeze all the tables, all the points to this line, you just see one straight line, but actually it was a circle. So it can't really, it just shows that the PCA can't help you see nonlinear patterns. And then the second one B is that uh, if your patterns are, I don't really know what non-orthogonal means, but I think it just means that they are, they are too highly correlated, but because if they are so correlated, they'll just treat them as the same. But if you want them to be different for your own application, the PCA thought may not help you view the difference so obviously. And then the third part was the so-called obscure clusters. Uh, that part, uh, I'm not so sure as well, but what I think is trying to say is that because they want to maximize the variance. So if everything got squeezed to one point, you might not see like there was actually one group here and one group there. 
But I guess it just also shows that there may be some clusters that may be hidden, even though you see a PC plot. So it also means that if you see no clusters in the PCA plot, it does not mean there is really no clusters. Maybe a different clustering algorithm can help you see the clusters instead. So, yeah, this is just my understanding when I read this paper. For the C1, right, the obscure cluster, is it because, because when they have to draw the line of best fit and I was thinking more of like, is it like the regressions, you know, like where we have to draw from the data point to the line of best fit? That's how we actually cut that. After that, we have the total sum of the variances, right? From, yes. right, from the data point to the line of best fit. The reason yeah. why for C was why it, there's a cluster, but we couldn't detect the cluster because they are all lines so perfectly straight. So they yeah. cancel one another out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can see. Yeah, I think that's a good way to see it as well. Right. There's yeah. a cluster, but we just don't see because when we're doing the calculation, they cancel one another. Yes, yeah. I see what you mean. Hmm. But then here, they don't talk about actually, I don't remember because I did PCA, right? I remember when we were like, just now back to the correlation, right? I was thinking like PCA, like the data has to be correlated to a certain extent, but they cannot be too highly correlated because I remember that was one of the assumptions to run PCA. So you need to make sure like they are correlated, but they cannot to be too highly correlated. They cannot pass a certain kind of like correlation values. Yeah, like I guess to the B case right when they are too too related to each other. They are one. very yeah the B is like definitely you can see the correlation there for the two lines. Yeah. And they call it non orthogonal Okay. Yeah maybe I will go read more about this first. <laughs> yeah but I guess the even though they say non orthogonal pattern but they say in here that it's Patterns that are highly correlated may be unresolved. Mm -hmm. Then they say figure 4B is showing that. Oh, B is the one that um, they cannot split into two obvious clusters. Okay. Yeah. But this is the interesting patterns. But but I can see why A is like very difficult to divide into clusters. But B, right, even though you see like, like actually why they can't divide into clusters, I was thinking like they can divide this way. Mm. Yeah, or maybe they are too closely related, is it? Yeah, maybe it's the result is that they may be, because they're too, co too correlated, they become very close to each other, and then we uh -huh. treat them as one. Ah, oh, okay, okay. I just can see what you mean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's another paper that I found that may be useful is by Susan Holmes and they provide some tips on how to plot them correctly, like which dimension reduction to use and how we should handle like the categorical cases where we have a mixture of numeric and categorical. And yeah, this part here on how many dimensions, like things like even though five is the rule, but some people say it's six and things get pretty bad when we have like uneven elbows. Uh, not sure if yeah, like this case here when you have like very uneven elbows. Although that's variable classification, it's not three plots. Sorry about that. I don't think we have a case here. 
yeah, this is the part where you have like very uneven elbows and then this is the part where it's really, really hard to know how many physical components you really need. This is the one you talk about, like where it suddenly drops then horizontal for a while, then drops again, right? Yeah. Does it happen? Is this happen in like biology cow paper? Yes, I never seen this one very unstable eigen values. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, and the good thing about this paper is that there's some they have the R codes to reproduce all these plots. So we can see oh sorry about that. But there are some R codes to reproduce these plots. So oh. we can see what kind of data that cause these problems as well. Is it possible to post the link in the chat for this uh, paper? Like the okay. tips for dimension reduction. See if I can. How do I yeah, open this chat? <laughs> okay, I found the chat. <laughs> okay. Like mm. this. Mm. Yeah, they're also in my slides. I just put the link there. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, everything I try to put the links there, like even the point of significance and everything. The, yeah, the next part uh, is the matrix completion. And I, it says that we have to sometimes handle missing values. Uh, one way is that we can remove the data with missing values, but it can be very wasteful. Alternatively, they can fill in the missing values to the mean of the column. Then they say there are also better methods using principal components. So I try to do it in the algorithm, but I try to do by the example, I try to show step by step how it works and, and try it for myself. So I, this data set is actually the one from Tau Stats. Yeah. So I just use the Tau Stats data. Then I just pick my own missing values. And then I use my own initialization to fill them, which is like the mean. So the mean is minus 0 0.5 for the first column and 1 for the second column. So I just fill them in. And then I use the function that was mentioned in the lab. So uh, this part here was 2a. So 2a was to calculate the principal components and get the estimated data. The estimated data is just the inverse. Like after we get the principal components, we get the loadings, we calculate the scores, and then we calculate the values back again. So this is actually that this part here. And then for iteration, and after we get back the estimated values, we put them back to the missing position. So these are the estimated values that we calculated from here. But instead of doing for all the replacing them all the values, we only replace those with the missing values. And then they after we put in some values, they compare like the difference, this objective. So what I did was that the missing data, which is this one, I do a difference between the estimated values that I had. And then I, yeah, I, I do this part here because it's more consistent with the objective but the lab actually takes an, a different formula for the objective but to me like for this case like this data set both kind of works so I just use the one that is closest to what the book says so this is just one iteration and after many iterations and have a certain threshold I keep the threshold to be a bit higher so that 
it will not run too much and cover up the whole screen of this slide. But what I did is that it reduces the error until it becomes small enough of 0 0.01. And then uh, I, I can compare with the heated data with the what I had for the actual data and somehow I don't know why but the the the, the values of the negative got swapped. <laughs> but the values are quite close but the but the signs got swapped. <laughs> And then I tried the soft impute formula that they have, and it's also quite close, except they get the, the negative values positions right, but it's quite close to the imputed data that I computed myself. <laughs> I keep moving forward is clustering methods. So uh, the book summarized clustering methods to split into distinct homogeneous groups such that two objectives like they give this very long phrase like observation within each groups are quite similar and observation in different groups are quite different so I just put them in pictures like this from this slide so observations within the clusters should be as close as possible but as observations in between clusters should be as far away as possible and they go through two clustering methods one is k-mean and hierarchical so K-mean clustering is that they want to create like non-overlapping clusters. So they had like, let I be mumble observations. And then we had two points to represent two different observations. And J, J is just the number of features we have. And they calculate like the distance between two points, two different points. And they use usually the Euclidean distance. So in, in, if J is two and we have two dimensional data, the, our Euclidean distance is just Pythagoras theorem. <laughs> so using the Euclidean distance as an example for distance, uh, they decided to have to calculate all the possible pairwise uh, spread Euclidean distance between observations in one cluster. So one cluster, first they create like the cave cluster. So this is like all the possible differences within one cluster, which is if you treat this point, for example, it's just all possible pairwise difference in this one cluster. But since we have K different clusters, which I just give off my K and this is just the number of samples in this cluster. So each of the clusters will have their own like have their own groups, their own pairwise distance. And I guess what this formula is saying is just after calculating all these pairwise distance, we, we just take the sum of them and just take the mean of the number of samples that we have. So, uh, so the goal of the KV cluster is to minimize these non-overlapping clusters to make it as small as possible. So they start with a simple example with three clusters and two features. And then the first part is that they just randomly assign uh, all the points to various clusters. And then the next part is they calculate like the center, like the mean for each of the clusters. And then they find out like, which point are closest to the clusters. So end up having this is after they calculate each point distance to each like the center or the center of the cluster, the one that is closest belongs to that cluster itself. And after that, they form our three clusters. They calculate the that weighted formula that we have def that they have defined earlier. So subsequently, they said that after like different iterations, like when you have the, these new clusters, they just move the centroid to the center again, and then they recalculate all the distance. And the shortest distance will be assigned to that cluster. And they claim that 
for each iteration, this value will always decrease. But, and then they see that it will stop until we have like if the decrease is very, very small, but I just put it as minimal changes. And they said about like things that some disadvantages is that they have for this k mean clustering, they have to determine how many clusters we have. And the second problem is that usually the first part is is the first part is the random clustering, which because it's random in the initial cluster, it may give inconsistent results. So they suggest the users to run it multiple times with different random initial configurations or should I say uh, this part should be more random as in as in uh, maybe this first the first time you use it this one become the first cluster maybe the second time will be like in the different class different groups so that it will be more robust but basically it's just trying to say that KV clusters tend to give inconsistent results and they claim that hierarchical clustering may be a better approach to counter this weakness that k mean clustering has. So the hierarchical clustering, they claim that it's a tree-based representation of observations called dendrograms and each leaf of the dendrograms represents like one observation and we can cut them into different clusters based on the given heights. So like this case here is that they cut them into two clusters. And this case here, they cut them into three clusters. So in practice, they will just, we just took it by eye to get a sensible number of how many clusters we have. And then it shows like how each cluster, each these clusters create. So I just took it from and uh, someone's GitHub page for RADs uh, and then they show that first all the points first are like the these points here, like the whereby each points are their own cluster, and then they start to take the shortest point and group them together as one new cluster here, and so we left with so called n minus one observations from n to n minus one. And then the iteration goes is that you'll find the next shortest distance and then it starts to merge them together again. So you can see in this GIF here, like this is the first one, the second one, then the next shortest one is here, the shortest one is here. You'll do it until there's one observation less or one cluster. So they also claim that the height of the blocks represents like distance between the clusters as well, represented by the hidden distance in this case. Now the problem is that because P5 and P6 are data points, we can calculate the distance between them. But when it comes to clusters, it's quite hard to determine how to, how to calculate a certain distance between one cluster to another cluster, like for example, P4. So well, they uh, introduced this concept of dissimilarity between observations, or uh, they call it linkage as well. So the book gives them in terms of words, but uh, I just used the pictures here from uh, Havana's uh, GitHub page to give a better explanation of what this distance and these linkages and distance really means like for example like the single linkage is the minimum distance the complete one is the maximum the average one is just the average between the two and the centroid linkage is so all your clusters they pick the center and then they pick the distance between the centers and as for and i also provide like one block that gives you like actual calculations of how these values are calculated. Uh, however, uh, due to time constraint, I cannot show how each step-by-step step it is and you can read it by yourself. Uh, but, but it's all handwritten notes and uh, how each calculation is made. And they, this part just says that 
different linkage give you different clustering results, unfortunately. <laughs> And uh, they and I just add some notes from Kabana, so I get half page about the pros and cons of the different linkages that he has, and what he favors, and what works, and what does not work. Now the next issue they have for hierarchical clustering is that because clustering is subjective, uh, for the same data set, we can classify into different groups. Like for example, this case we can classify based on color and we can classify based on shapes. And here's another slide is where we can classify by families and school employees or just male and females. And it can be very subjective as well. So the problem is because they it's based on the dissimilarity measures that we use that can give you different clusters. So in the in the book itself, it shows that for this case, whereby the shape is the same, you can treat them as one cluster for based on shapes, which is called the correlation-based distance. So two and one become one cluster and three become another cluster. On the other hand, we just based on Euclidean distance, which is the y-axis, then three and one will be one cluster instead, and two will be a different cluster altogether. So it's really give you different values. So the last part of the book was like some practical issues in clustering and some questions, lots of questions that needs to be taken care of. Like should it be standardized in the case of hierarchical clustering? Which dissimilarity measures should you use to give you meaningful results? What kind of linkage to use? And how should we cut them into clusters? And in caring clustering, like, how many clusters do you want? And they also give warnings like, because if you have any outliers that do not belong to any cluster, they may, the only clusters, they may heavily uh, distort your results. As a result, uh, they say that clustering are usually not very robust to very large changes in your data. And they recommend like doing clustering of subsets of data to get a sense of how robust it is. And that's why I'm interested in the tidy class uh, development because I thought maybe they can find a way to calculate the robustness of the clusters using some form of cost validation method. <laughs> and we shall see how the development goes. And finally, for my last slide, I just want to introduce a web page we can see like. I do class here, which is a link. You can actually play around and analyze how good your cluster is. Like for example, like having clustering, uh, it will not work for this cluster well. Uh, it does not work so well because you have one very big cluster and then the, yeah, I'll increase the size if I can. You can see like, as the iteration goes, the KV clustering, even though it, we say three cluster, but because of how the randomization of the cluster goes in the initial stage, uh, it kind of gives, keeps giving me these inaccurate results of how these three clusters are classified because of the wrong positions of how the centroid was initially placed. Uh, however, for... Uh, Hierarchical clustering, I just use an average linkage and try to speed up. <laughs> I think I only have two minutes left, but let's see how it goes. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is really a good website. Oh, from one, it's a university website. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a university website. I also put the link in here in the in, slides. You can okay, try okay. all different clusterings and different data sets. And mm, maybe that's a good way to test like how good a clustering is in certain mm. shapes and can show like strengths and weaknesses of different clustering algorithms on different kinds of data sets. They also have different types of data sets, but I just picked the default one. As you can see, like, Hierarchical clustering, like even though it's much more slower, uh, I think in the end it might give a more accurate result. But I don't think we have enough time. Only have one minute left. <laughs> mm -mm. Yeah, but you have, yeah, I, I can see it's on the slides, right? Yeah, I can try out myself the links. 
<laughs> so you say hierarchical clustering. Let yeah, did this is <laughs> this fun. Yeah, I tried to add more resources other than the books that provides uh so that we can see things for ourselves and understand better how it works. I think now it's forming better clusters now. Like you can see like here it's forming one group already. Maybe this was forming another group. And my mm. And then uh, let's see if it improves. Oh, the yeah. dendrogram is interactive one down there. Yes, yes, you can mm. actually push it down. I think my computer's a bit slow. <laughs> the, the, uh, drag this line to obtain different clusters. Because I guess there's three mm -hmm. different colors. So. Yeah. Okay, so I guess that's all I have for today. <laughs> There are some hiccups here that I couldn't do as well, but this is all I can provide and hopefully it's useful. It's really useful. I didn't know about some of these resources that you point out. So it's really helped. It's like really useful in understanding the concept of clustering, especially. Yes, I always have trouble with like clustering, it's like picking the appropriate method. So I think this one will help me to understand. Yeah, I guess but really slight. <laughs> yeah, I guess the problem is that we can't really see the data sets. That's the problem. Yeah, but this one is like because they gave us the data set, so we kind of like we can know. But the problem with like real data, right? Even though we did this PCA, we have no. But I always have no idea whether I've done the clustering correctly. <laughs> You just like feel like guessing all the time. More well, like based on luck. This one is real data set or is it was a simulation? The data I set that they provided. This is all, they look like simulated to me, like the classic points and they're not unless you put your own data set inside, but oh. yeah, like you can load data set inside, but or uh, X import data set, <laughs> but I guess, mm -hmm. yeah, you can just just put the uh, some mass data set that's a bit more confidential, and then we see if it works. <laughs> but I guess it only also works in two dimensional as well, and multi dimensional maybe not so easy. Mm. Okay, I think we should end here because now it's eleven. <laughs> Yes, yes. Pass that time. Yeah, but thank so you. Then I, I will post in the Slack later on like, or tomorrow. Then we will postpone the one next week to the following week. Then we will continue after that. Mm, so, yeah. Thank you so much, Sherry. Then I'll see you again in two weeks. Yeah, sure. Bye bye. Bye.